My name is Eloisa Mesqua, and I'm here as part of the curatorial committee for the Penn World Voices Festival. Uh, it's our first festival back since the before times. Um, and it's just so lovely to see all of you here, for all of the readers to be here, the panelists, um, and for us to just be like in community and sharing space with masks on, however it has to happen, but it's great that we get to be here. Um, so Pen, Pen America is an organization whose mission is to unite writers and their allies to celebrate the power of the written word and champion the freedom to write. And when we were given the task of uh, curating events and, and trying to think of what kinds of stories we wanted to bring forward for audiences, uh, it was very important for me uh, that migration be something that is talked about. Uh, because I think while migrant stories are different, uh, borders look different, they're in different places geographically, um, there's so much desire and hope and fear and grief that comes with those stories. Um, and so I'm very fortunate to have gathered this incredible group of people to uh, come talk about their stories, uh, fiction, nonfiction. Um, Ophelia could not be here tonight, but poetry. Um, all of these genres uh, grapple with what it means to migrate. Um, the before and the after, and the after after that continues to happen for generations. Um, I want to thank my fellow curatorial committee members, uh, including Cl uh, Clarice Raza Sharif, uh, who is from Pen America, John Freeman, Divyani Saltzman, and Louise Simon, who worked on the events that are happening in Los Angeles. Um, now, I'm especially pleased to introduce today's event in the same boat, Narratives of Borders and Migration, uh, and welcome Jean Guerrero, author of Hate Monger, uh, Yuri Herrera, Usman Umar, and Omar Alakad for a conversation about the distinct and intersecting crises that leave people displaced, uprooted, and seeking safety in new contexts, and their collision with the surging nationalism and xenophobia, fortifying and further weaponizing the borders between us. Thank you all for coming today, uh, and now here's who you came to see, not me. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to talk about these incredibly beautiful, brilliant, and important books. I can't recommend them enough. I genuinely was changed by all of these books. So to start, your books are all acts of radical resistance against the xenophobic winds sweeping across the globe. As I read them, I just kept thinking what powerful counterweights they were to the white supremacist narratives that were popularized under the Trump administration, specifically the popularization of the white supremacist book, The Camp of the Saints, which paints refugees as, as an invasion of animals, um, a narrative that really has taken hold on Fox News with Fox News host Tucker Carlson, uh, was popularized by figures like Stephen Miller, who I wrote my book about, and Steve Bannon. Dehumanization is a main tool of these narratives designed to spread hate. You all in your own ways accomplish the opposite. And so I wanna ask you if you can talk a little bit about how you did that and, and maybe take this opportunity to share with people who aren't familiar with, with your work what, what the stories are about. And anyone, any one of you guys can kind of jump in. If you wanna start, what was one? Thank you very much, definitely. For me, it's a huge opportunity being here today. And um, I need to tell the truth that this is my first time in the US and my English is not, sometimes it's, my expressions are not well understood, but I hope we can try. Please forgive me if my expressions are not well um, explained or understood, but the fact is I'll do all my best to make it possible. Um, the truth is that, um, my book, North to Bar Paradise, to be truth, is not my story. 
or mainly it's not only my story. North to Paradise is the story of hundreds, thousands of other people who could have made it to arrive in Libya, Spain, to be able to write or explain their stories. Of course, since humanity started, we all know that migration has been something very common. But the sadness part of reality is that almost 95% of people have started my journey from Ghana made it to Libya. In which conditions? Have any one of you just imagined how many liters of water do you need for just an hour excursion? I had only five liters of water to cross the Sahara Desert. Three terrible weeks. So definitely, um, I'm not coming, I'm not here just to tell you how terrible my life has been. I think the most important thing is what am I proposing to solve this huge issue, which is the second part of the project, or the main reason why today we are here, at least in my opinion. We are all talking about migration. Migration existed since our forefathers started. We know about humanity. So instead of just talking about migration, what can you and myself do today? It's not about solving the world's problem. The little you can do, but act. So that's the little, my little contribution. If there's any more questions about love to paradise or anything about migration, I would therefore try to bring more details. But at, at least that's my little contribution to introduce what, who I am and what love to paradise is about. Thank you so much, Osman. Well, um, uh, first of all, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for the, the organizers, to Jean. Um, uh, it's a pretty complex <laughs> question. What I would say is this: uh, migrating is it's in our DNA. It's it's in our it's in our design. If there if we can talk about something like that, it's something that we have been doing since the beginning of times, or since we started counting time. But uh, at some point, human beings started treating other people coming as different at different people or as na or as not as people and i think one of the tasks of literature is not so much to discover something new but to underline something that has always been there in front of our eyes and that for different reasons for political reasons for religious reasons for for other kinds of reasons we just decide not to see uh, right before coming, coming up here, we were talking about how it's not about just pointing fingers, which I think it's necessary sometimes, but it's, a, it's about acknowledging the, the problem. How we deal with something begins with acknowledgement, and then we have to start uh, discussing how we acknowledge something. So I think literature is not intended to solve a problem, but it's intended to create critical thinking or to give tools so that every person starts reflecting ethically on something that is happening not in a faraway country, not in a faraway time, but right here in front of their, of their eyes in the same place where, where they live because there is no place that has not been created thanks to migrants. Um, thank you so much for, for doing this and for letting me be a part of this panel. Um, every once in a while, the organizers of something like this think that it's a good idea to put me on the same stage with people who actually know what they're talking about. 
and it's it's almost universally a bad idea. Um, uh, despite my career as a journalist, I, I mostly make stuff up. So uh, if there's any discrepancy between what I talk about and what the rest of the panelists talk about, for the love of God, listen to them uh, instead. Um, I was born in Egypt. Uh, I grew up in a place called Qatar, this little peninsula sticking out of Saudi Arabia. And Qatar is sort of pound for pound the richest place on earth. They have massive, massive natural gas and oil reserves, more money than they know what to do with. And as a result, 90% uh, of Qatar is non-Qatari. It's people who've come in from other parts of the planet to, to cash in on, on that wealth. And in order to show up in Qatar, unless you're a tourist or something, you have to show up with something called a kafela, which is a sponsorship. So a local company or a local person has to sponsor you, and you are there for as long as they wish it to be the case. And if they decide, they wake up one day, they're having a bad day, they decide to revoke your sponsorship, you're out within 24 hours. You can't get, you can never really get citizenship or own a home or anything like that. It's understood you're there to make a little bit of money, but you are temporary. And there's a word for what happens when you get kicked out. It's, it's a word called uh, itfennish. So you'd be like, you know, what happened to Steve? Itfennish. That means you got, you got, you're done. You... And for the longest time, I thought this was an Arabic word. It just sounds Arabic. Uh, and then years later, my father said, no, no, it's a corruption of the English for finish, as in you're finished. And, you get it. and I, I've always been fascinated by the intersection of, of what it means to be unanchored and uh, the language we use for that, because we have an entire spectrum for designating human beings and, in fact, dehumanizing them according to where they fit on that spectrum of language, illegal, alien, economic migrant, my, all the way down to expat, which is what we call white Westerners who show up to these parts of the world. Um, and I write a lot about that. So I wrote this, this novel called What Strange Paradise, which is a repurposed fable. Um, it's a reinterpretation of Peter Pan as a story of a contemporary child refugee um, because I wanted to take the language of a comforting fable that Westerners have been telling their kids for the last hundred years and I wanted to flip it around and use it to tell a different kind of story. Um, so that's the roots of this particular book, and it's very closely related to my thinking about literally the words we use to describe human beings and how much of their humanity is left behind, depending on which words we use. Absolutely. And all of you have this concept in your work of of paradise, you know, of a better world waiting on the other side of this treacherous journey. But at the same time, the, the protagonist in your book, whether it's you, as in your case, or a fictional protagonist, they're often faced with cruelty, with greed, with loneliness, disorientation, not only along their journeys, but upon arriving on, at their destinations, which quickly undermines this, this idea of paradise. Uh, you know, they're, they're escaping all kinds of violence, but at the same time, they're facing others, nationalism, xenophobia, and, race, and racism. And one of the most powerful things about all of your, your books, I found, was just this tension that you explore between that good and evil, between that paradise and that non-paradise. Um, Omar, for example, in, in What Strange Paradise, uh, there's a conversation b between the colonel who's chasing this little boy um, and, and the little boy, where he says, you know, he tries to undermine the idea of kindness. He says, what do you think the prerequisite for kindness is? Have you ever tried to be kind to someone better off than you? And the, he argues that he, in his hatred of this refugee boy, actually sees him as existing in a way that someone who is kind to him does not. And I found that to be a really, a really interesting thing to explore, and I, I was hoping you could talk about your decision to incorporate that perspective. Sure, yeah. Um, so, Colonel Kethros, who's, who's the Captain Hook character in this, in this story, is chasing this boy around, and he's, and he's chasing him. It has devolved beyond reason now. It's sort of a, this weird psychopathic obsession with capturing this one child. Um, and, and a lot of his position, I think, has to do with, with just straight xenophobia. Um, but also, I mean, I'm obsessed with, particularly in this part of the world, the conflation of, of the individual and the systemic. We live in an incredibly individualistic society, a society where almost every societal vector is tailored towards the individual good and away from the communal good. 
and we are coming up against a time when the central existential crises of our time require the exact opposite approach. A pandemic does not care about vectors of individual good. Climate change does not care about vectors of individual good. Um, and yet we have a society where it is firmly believed by many people, and I'm including many liberal progressives, I'm not just talking about sort of, you know, Trump country or anything like that, this notion that individually you can solve systemic problems. If you empathize hard enough, enough individual charity, enough individual action, you can solve a systemic problem. Um, and I tend to write against that. I tend to write against that, that fallacy to me. Um, all the charity in the world is not going to solve a system that, you know, in the case of something like how Europe treats migrants, the system in place is not broken. <laughs> It is functioning exactly as intended. It is doing what it was intended to do. Um, and so these people are caught up in, in the middle of this. You have this colonel who's been put in this incredibly impotent position of basically running around trying to chase ghosts. He has no idea who's showing up on the island. He has no idea where these people are coming from and it infuriates him. And he's trying to individually create a system of what he perceives to be normal and good and right and it's falling apart all around him. And I think that sort of leads to that, that position. Beautiful. And Osman, you in North to Paradise, right? You know, given all of the hardship that I experienced, it would be easy to think that the world is full of bad people, but I prefer to think that most people are good. It's just that the good people make less noise. And I, I, I found that to be really fascinating. And, and you know, you, you do, you see the ugliest of humanity and yet you still come to this conclusion. Um, but but you're, you don't shy away from the ugliness, you capture it vividly. So talk about that tension in, in your book. Um, for me, I think um, there is this freezer vape I used when it was downstairs that if you have a problem, <laughs> and you are not aware of it, then you have a big problem. But if you have a problem, at least you are aware of that. You've already solved half of it. I think the kind of world we've created is too much full of fear. So in my opinion, I think um, Based on my life experience, of course, when I arrived in Barcelona after a terrible five years trekking journey crossing the whole uh, north countries of Africa, for example, and in the Mediterranean Sea and all that, I end up in an island called Fuerteventura. Before that, from the Sahara Desert, I, was, I arrived in Libya. Those days, Muammar al-Gaddafi was the president of Libya. I promised you, when I arrived in Libya, I wasn't put in jail. When I arrived in Europe for the first time, the only place for me was jail. I didn't have to commit any crime. Who are the fathers of human rights? The Western world or Gaddafi? After two months in jail, I was considered a minor, 17 years. And through that, I have my right to stay. They, don't, they can deport me back to Ghana. From Fortaventura Island to Malaga, Spain, I was anchored. With so full of soldiers. So when I get to Barcelona, the idea of paradise, for example, was like, I, I can't just believe it. This is paradise, I don't think so. The illusion of arriving paradise disappeared in a second. I still remember going on the, on the, on the street, greeting people, nobody answered my greetings. Until I greeted a woman and she was like shocking. I said, What? But what are you afraid of? Uh, afraid of? I'm just greeting you. I wasn't armed. I promise you, I never had any weapon on me. People were afraid of me. 
So I think racism, or let's say, for, in my opinion, and yeah, that's my opinion, is lack of knowledge, fear of the poor. That's my opinion of racism. Absolutely. And you, you in, uh, we were talking about a couple of your books, but in Signs Preceding the End of the World, uh, you invert this idea of the United States, you know, the American dream being paradise. You, you, you know, you kind of turn the U.S. into the underworld. Um, can you talk about how and, and why you inverted this idea in that book? Well, um, oh, um first thing I would say is that people migrate for many reasons. Some people are running away from family, or some people are running away from the police, or from the army, or from poverty. But some people are just running towards something that it's not necessarily paradise, but it sometimes it's just the unknown that you want to embrace. And sometimes it's just a hell of your own choosing. It's not that migrants are so naive that to think that this other place is going to be paradise, but they, they just decide not to be a hostage of the conditions in which you were born or the conditions in which you were put. And for me, that, that, that is a, a very important part of understanding the issue, that, it, that migrants are not just characters to be put in some, in two or three prefabricated boxes, but, but migrants have very different, very different uh, lives. And in the case of Makina, the, the character in, in my novel, she is actually having the, the opposite, or, or, or she is dealing with the opposite sensation, which is something that happens to a lot of migrants, that when you have to leave your family, your language, your places, your food, your, uh, your everything, it's like an end of the world. So this is the tension in this novel, that she is somehow afraid of not being able to come back. She is a, a, a afraid of, of the, the possibility that her world is, is going to end. And that, well, I, I'm not going to say the, the whole thing for the people who have not read it, because otherwise you're not going to buy it. And, and so, um, but one of the things that, that, that she finds is it's not so much that the world is disappearing, but that the version of herself is transforming. And for me, that is one of the most important things when we talk about uh, migration, that it's a process that transforms us, and at the same time, we are transforming the place where we go. We are transforming the language, we are transforming the, 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 the space of work, we are transfor transforming the way in which we understand communities. And, um, well, this, these are some ideas that I try to, to, to use as a guidance when, when uh, creating this character. And, and, you know, we have, we have borders for human beings, obviously, everywhere across the earth. We don't have borders for capital and we don't have borders for weapons. So there's various types of borders that, you know, there's a double standard when it comes to borders. Um, I saw the devastating impact of having borders for human beings and not for capital and not for weapons when I was reporting on commodities um, for the Wall Street Journal in Mexico and Central America, how it keeps black and indigenous communities trapped in poverty and forced to risk their lives for a better opportunity. And Yudi, in your latest book, A Silent Fury, you, you talk about this horrible, it's not about migration, but you talk about this horrible fire in a mine that's operated by a U.S. subsidiary in Mexico where dozens of people were killed in 1920, and you reconstruct this with incredible detail. What can you share that you learned from writing this book about the freedom of movement and what happens when you restrict it and the different kinds of borders that, that we create between ourselves? Uh, one thing I often talk about is that, that we should talk about the border condition and not just about the border as a physical thing or a political thing, as a, as a place with barbed, barbed wire and, uh, and military. This is a, a very important 
uh, expression of the border, but there is also the, when I talk about that, the border condition is what some people have to deal with when they are working in some place and that even if it's far away from the actual border, they have to face the same kind of, uh, of problems that, they, that, that migrants would face. Like if they speak a different language from what some people expect them to speak, they will call the police, and they and you have to hide, and you have to to work for for uh, just a little bit of money because you are a, a, a second or third class citizen, and this is something that happens also within our countries. So this story, uh, uh, the border mine fire, is something that I I researched years ago. And I will just, just say really fast what, what it's about. In 1920, there was a fire in this mine called El Bordo in my hometown in Pachuca. And the, um, the owners of the mine, who were American, decided to close off the, the mine to stop the fire. But they just decided to do it when the miners were still in there. So basically, they buried them alive. So there was an investigation, but the investigation was just about the origins of the fire, which they never discovered, but not about the responsibility of the owners of the mine in killing their, their own miners. And um, so I went through the whole judicial file, and the, for instance, the families, the relatives of the miners, were cross-examined in a really violent way because the authorities were thinking that, oh, you're just faking that you're a relative of the miner because you want to get all the money that we are going to give to you, which, by the way, they didn't give them any at the end. But they never, ever interrogated or questioned the owners of the mine. So, you know, so there is a, a sort of, of also first uh, uh, um, as difference of citizenship, even with it, w within our, our borders. And even more than that, w you, you mentioned this when, uh, when we were talking before, I also researched how the press was talking about this. And one thing that was very notable to me was that the journalists used to say, like, yeah, our miners, descendant from the Aztecs, they don't fear to die. They are ready to go and die every day. And this is something that people say about other people, you know? When you assume that someone else doesn't fear death, you are already saying that, well, they are expendable, you know? Because they, they don't even appreciate their own lives. So, yeah, the same border condition that we can see in the actual borders is, is part of a logic that is reproduced in other, in other spaces, you know? And Ozvan, you, you experienced this, you know, being bordered off by other humans and not having your humanity recognized. And, you know, you saw the devastating consequences of other people being dehumanized, where so many people died on your journey. Uh, these are things that you witnessed. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how you were able to come away from that, deciding, like, I want to give back to this world, despite all of that darkness? Um, just I was talking with Omar about um, the first speech I read about his book just a couple of some 30 minutes ago and he was describing this famous image we all see on the televisions about, about that was 2016 if I'm lying where a five years boy the body of a five years boy, boy who was drawn on the Mediterranean Sea from Syria and that image provoke a lot of movement around the, around the whole world. And yes, of course, that picture shocked me, of course. But the truth is that hundreds and thousands and thousands of migrants have been crossing the Mediterranean Sea for years. I crossed the Mediterranean Sea 2004, 2005. The first attempt was about 185 people per each boat. A few miles inside of sea, a boat where my best friend, Musa, Sapashina, Lassamilo, all of them died. In the second boat, and once again, 185 80, 80 plus people died again. More than 350 people died on my trip. You 
just can't do anything. You just can't even save your own life. How are you going to save somebody's life? So what I'm trying to say is that yes, bodies exist. We've created them ourselves on our interest. When we are interested, depending on the interest, there are no bodies. Depending on what we are interested in, they are bodies. The real example is what's happening right now in Ukraine. I still remember the first time I met the Pope because he was really worried about migration and he really wanted to know somebody who had experienced it in his flesh. So I had the opportunity to meet the Pope. There are only three words I still remember about that meeting. He said, when we talk about migration, the only verbs that should be accepted uh, integ- uh, integrity, accepting people who are running from hell. There are ways to open humanitarian corridors to accept people who are f- seeking for support. It seems almost impossible to open these corridors. He was asking me, Umar was asking me how many people have died in the Mediterranean Sea. I don't have the global numbers, but during my trip, I have the numbers. How many more have to die before we realize that we are talking about human beings? Today, we've seen what's happening in Ukraine, that yes, exist corridors I'm not trying to victimize or criticize this situation. I'm just trying to enlighten it. I'm very, very glad and happy to see this sign of humanity, this empathy to accept these people. But please, if we can, let's do the same thing to all other migrants and refugees from any other corner of the world. I think, and I'm happy to say, I think we have really good people in this world. Today, we are all here to find ways to solve the, the little we can to make our little world a better place. This means that hundreds and thousands of people are doing a lot of things to find solutions. But let's vis- make it visible. Let's connect these initiatives. At the age of 16, 17 years in Barcelona, I didn't know how to read and write. I started schooling at the age of 19, 18, 19 years. In only six years, I was capable to get to university. Education is the only key. Nelson Mandela says it years ago, the strongest weapon to transform any community, any society, is education. Imagine Omar, an 18 years illiterate migrant from Africa, a poor family. Today, more than 43 different schools in Ghana, 20,000 children have access to education for something an illiterate like me created. Imagine if we get together we can definitely solve this issue. We can do it. We only need to look at our surroundings, the nature. The sun comes out not to heat himself. The river pour from the mountain down not to feed, feed um, tasty of itself, but for other animals to be able to drink water. This means that as a human being, if we don't live to assist the others, we don't even deserve to live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Osman. You were talking about visibility earlier, and and it just reminded me of, of something that Omar and I were talking about earlier, just about, I don't think these were the exact words that you used, but how it's very hard to get 
politicians to do anything about a negative. Like when, I don't think the negative is the word that you used, but just the fact that we don't even know how many people have drowned trying to reach, you know, Europe or the United States. We, we, the few times that I, as a reporter covering immigration, walked the U.S.-Mexico smuggling routes with a group of volunteers who goes out searching for lost migrants, uh, I came across human remains repeatedly. I, I went out three different weekends, and every day we came across at least one um, human skeleton, human remains, um, dis decomposing body. And it was just shocking to me, because this isn't something that's in our public awareness, the fact that it's happening right here every day. You know, hundreds of people die every, every year trying to reach the United States, and, and, but we just don't talk about it. And so, Omar, can you just talk, talk a little bit about this idea of um, visibility and how, how, how hard it is to get people to care about or to do anything about something that is not visible to them? And how your book plays into that. Um, I was, a long time ago, I was, in, I was in Miami, I was doing a story on climate change, and, a, and I had a few extra days, and so I decided to drive up to this town just outside Atlanta, where uh, for years there's been a law in the books that says every household needs to own a gun. So it's completely unconstitutional. It was, it was one of those stories, I was writing for a Canadian newspaper, and it's one of those, like, look at Americans type of stories, and I don't feel good about it in hindsight, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Nonetheless, this necessitated a drive. You drive up that highway all the way up into, into Georgia, and so I'm driving past the Florida-Georgia line, and, and I get across to the other side, and as soon as I cross, there's just this giant billboard, and all it says is, secede. It doesn't even say, like, visit our website or brought to you by or whatever, just secede. And it was fascinating to me for a variety of reasons. One is that, you know, I have dual citizenship now, but this country is, is very foreign to me. I, I grew up on, you know, American action movies in the 80s, and so I thought I understood this country. I, I don't understand this country in the slightest. Um, but it was also fascinating to me because um, when you win a war against a side, usually you impose restrictions on the kind of language and the kind of ideology that caused that war in the first place. That is one of the privileges of being on the winning side. And here was the losing side of a war allowed to keep in massive font, you know, the, 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 the central ideology of the cause. And I was thinking about that relative to the fact that as far as I know, Japan still can't have a standing army, symbolically, is not allowed to have a stand. And I was thinking about the differentiation of that and the only conclusion I could come to is that it's very different calculus when the people on whom you are imposing a regime of any kind of restriction look like you and sound like you. And I think we were talking about the negative space of the migrant crisis, which is a term that I have serious issues with for, for other reasons. Um, there are no... Well, I mean, the idea that Europe doesn't have a migrant crisis. Lebanon has a migrant crisis. That's a society that's on a very shaky footing that's taken a million refugees. Um, one of the richest societies in human history, having a bunch of people show up desperate for a better life, if that's enough to, to bring down that society, and that society was having problems to begin with. Um, so anyway, but, but, you know, calling it the migrant crisis, I suppose... If you live in the privileged part of the world, there are almost no consequences to not thinking about that. And on top of that, it's happening to people who, relative to the power structure that makes the decisions about these things, does not look like them and does not sound like them. And those two things in tandem are incredibly dangerous. Um, and I think, you know, again, I make stuff up for a living. I write novels. And novels are a good place to dwell. And, and when you dwell on these issues, at the very least, you can try to counteract both of these things. You can say, this isn't far away, and this isn't someone else. Um, Borges has once said that all literature is tricks, and eventually, no matter how clever your tricks are, they get discovered. My tricks are not particularly clever. I'm, I'm desperately trying to take the thing that is far away and put it in the heart of the empire. Um, in the hopes that I can counteract these two things. Whether that works or not is an entirely separate story, but that at least is my intent. That's beautiful. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about language 
and, and its role in these types of narratives. Uh, Yuri, in Signs Preceding the End of the World, the main character, Makina, says of other migrants who are living in the U.S., they might be talking in perfect Latin tongue and without warning begin talking in perfect Anglo tongue and keep it up like that, alternating between a thing that believes itself to be perfect and a thing that believes itself to be perfect. What, what is the role of, of language and translations in migration stories like, like yours? I, I was wondering if you can talk about whether your ideas about language have changed in, in the writing of, of, of this Yeah, book. I think uh, our language is changing all the time. The only place where language doesn't change is in the dictionaries, but the dictionaries are old one second after they are published because, because language is, is, is changing with the, with the speakers all the time. And some of the most fascinating speakers are, are migrants, you know, because they are all, they are dealing with the, with the world that they had left and the, the world that they are discovering. And they are doing this at, at the same time. It's a constant process of, of translation. I remember when I was living in El Paso, I was teaching Spanish for people who were, who were born in a Spanish-speaking country, but they were not educated there. And it was a really interesting process for me, a really interesting experience. Some young kids, 18, 19 years old, that they have learned Spanish with their families, um, but they were speaking a Spanish that I identified with the Spanish that my grandmother uh, spoke, for instance, because they have been educated in the United States in, in English, and they had all these words that were not used anymore, and, I, and they were ashamed of using them. And I told them, you're like a living encyclopedia, because you have, all, you, you, you have these times living inside you, and you have these realities living inside you. The idea that we abandon one place forever is not true, because those places keep, keep determining certain things in, in, in the way we, we understand community, in the way we understand our future. Uh, so reflecting on this, yes, of course, was very important. And this book in particular is a book in which I try to reflect that, how the voyage of the, of the character um, should be reflected in the change in her language. And, that, and I also introduce several words that are either made up by me or uh, they are really old word, words that no, nobody understood because that is the way in which we come to the world of language. When we are small, we don't know anything. Every, every word is made up. Every word is arbitrary. So we embrace them, and by doing it, we change them. Because every word is, goes through our body. And when we do language, when we go, make language going through our body, it yes, it's like putting it through, through hot oil, you know? what words change with every single person. It's funny that you say that because that's exactly what I felt after reading Science Proceeding the End of the World, that my body had changed, uh, especially that word that you use. I mean, I read the English translation, um, but she did, the English translation did a very good job of translating this word, uh, verse, uh, just to journey. And it just changes the whole... Is that, that, is that the little yeah. translation? Well, what I decided to use just to annoy the readers, and, and, and especially the translators, uh, uh, was to use a, a word from um, 13th century, uh, what would be Spain, and, uh, that is harcha. And the harcha was the last part of certain poems written in Arabic characters, but they already were sounding what then later would be the Spanish language. And this word described also like the exit of the poem. And very often it was a feminine voice saying goodbye to, to a lover. And when I was reading about this, I said, this is my novel. My character is a woman who is changing the way these languages are changing. And she is exiting one place. So instead of using the word exit or exiting, I used harcha or harchar. And I decided not to explain it, yes, so that people would figure it out and that they would understand that it meant exit, but this exiting, this moving from one place to another, is not just one moving from one place to another, but it's a transformational experience. 
And it was a problem when the moment to translate it came. And Lisa Dillman, my, my translator, who is one of the wisest persons I, I know, she just came up with this solution, which is she, when it was a noun, she used it verse, and when it was a verb, it, it, she used to verse, because it, it um, took the poetic component of the original word, and at the same time it described movement. And I loved it. And, you know, I, in general, I respect the work of translators. I think it's one of the most creative, beautiful, and difficult uh, uh, jobs, and it should be much better recognized and much better paid. And, Usman, uh, you, we were talking earlier about how many, I can't remember how many different languages you speak, but you had to learn to speak so many different languages just to survive. Um, and, and, but you write, I believe you write in Spanish, is that correct? Yes, I, de I definitely write in Catalan, not Spanish. <laughs> yeah, so can you talk about the, the role of language in your work and how you think about it when you're, when you're telling your story um, and, and the languages that you choose to tell your story in? Um, yes, I think um, in the first place I was so fortunate to be born in one of the most democratic countries in Africa, Ghana. Is the, I remember meeting, uh, the first time I met one a journalist, she was like, where are you from? I'm from a Ghana. Ghana, which country is that? I said, Ghana, it's in Africa. Uh, ah, okay, Ghana, yes. And he said, Usman, if a country in Africa don't appear in the newspapers, that means that this is a good news. Because the only news we normally hear from Africa are terrible news. Sorry. <laughs> So, um, Ghana, of course, was colonized by Great Britain, so our first language is English, not the U.S. English, British English. <laughs> um, but apart from that, we have 42 different languages more. For example, my father was Wala and my mother is Gunja, so I had to speak both languages. And I was born in the Bron half region, I have to speak three. We speak about Dagomba, with the tribe uh, surrounded, we have the Gomba tribe around, so I learned Dagomba. From Ghana to Libya, I had to learn Hausa, in Libya, nobody speaks Wala, no Gunja, no Hausa. I have to, speak, I have to learn Arabic. After this, I get to Barcelona, Catalan. What is Catalan? <laughs> In order to go to school, I have to learn Catalan, read and write Catalan, Spanish, read and write Spanish. In high school, so definitely, um, I consider myself that yes, um, at least I'm not good in anything, but language, at least I'm a bit good. Of course, in a week I can learn a U.S. accent, but <laughs> but um, I'm quite good in languages. So um, yes, I was writing Catalan, and then I translated my Facebook was written in Catalan and then in, in Spanish. And of course, I remember she was asking me, when you are angry, what language do you normally <laughs> uh, speak? And it's strange, but I dream in Catalan, but when I'm angry, I sometimes use Dutch words or, or Spanish. So, yes, I think uh, language is one of the most important thing, tool we have to be able to understand each other. And of course, peace is peace. We can never get peace if we can't share and understand each other. And I think a language facilitates this process. So I think it's fundamental to have access or at, at least uh, facilitate the learning of languages or speaking different languages. So for me, I think it's very, very important. That's so true. And I mean, monolingualism is truly a minority condition on this planet. Most people on this planet speak, uh, grow up speaking multiple languages. And this idea that we have in our culture that um, it's bad or it's burdensome to have so many languages in, in one country, I think just reflects this desire to restrict who can belong, um, who can belong in wherever, you know, the nativists are um, using this as a tool to exclude um, and Omar, in, in your book, you have this, this girl who, who helps Amir to escape, um, and they don't speak the same language, um, and, and they have these really touching interactions where they're trying to communicate through signs, and I, and I, I, I thought that that choice was really interesting, and I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about, about that decision to have these two children who, who don't understand each other, who are very different from each other, but who ultimately... Um, come together and connect in this really beautiful way. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so for, for those of you who are not who are not familiar with my work, um, I specialize in stone cold bummers, just incredibly depressing. Um, if you're looking to have your day ruined, you can try either of my novels. Um, if you don't have that kind of time, any of the short stories. Um, or you can just come talk to me. My personality has a similar, similar effect. Um, to give you a sense, my first novel was translated into Chinese, and they changed the title from American War to Nobody Survives. That is, that is the title of my book in China. Um, so it should come as, as no surprise that one of the areas of, my, of obsession for me with language is the ways in which the, the misuse of language can be used as a facilitator of violence. Um, a while back, when I was still working as a journalist, we were down in Guantanamo Bay, and we were touring the prison camps there. And I was asking the soldier who was giving us a tour, I was asking him a question, and I said, you know, so when do the prisoners... And as soon as I got to the word prisoners, he stopped me, and he said, we don't have prisoners here, sir, we have detainees. And it was very, very important to that gentleman, to his worldview, and to his role in this enterprise, that there be no prisoners here, they be detainees. Because a prisoner, by definition, has to have a prison sentence of some kind. You have to define it. A detainee you can hold forever. Um, my friend Michelle, who, who worked uh, a long time covering Gitmo, reminded me recently that there were no interrogations in Guantanamo Bay. Of course, they interrogated people left, right, and center, but they never called it that. They called it a reservation, as in the detainee has an 8.30 p.m. reservation. That meant that they were going to be taken to the shed. Um, we tend to think of violence not exclusively, but primarily as a physical thing, bombs going off, guns, so on and so forth. But that can't exist in of itself in a vacuum. There are other load-bearing beams that hold physical violence up, and one of them is linguistic violence, the deliberate misuse of words, the deliberate uh, obliteration of meaning. Um, and I was thinking about that when I was putting together What's Strange Paradise, because the central interaction between the two main characters is largely non-linguistic. They don't speak the same language. Um, and they are children, they are at the time of what is probably our only honest interaction with the world before we grow up and all the conceits of capitalism and daily living and all the lies we have to tell ourselves sort of come into play. Um, and so on a practical level, a lot of that conversation, a lot of the way that they say, you know, how old are you? I'm five, I'm, you know, the, the hand gestures, a lot of that came from my childhood growing up in Qatar where 90% of us were from somewhere else. And so there's a natural assumption that... Um, this person is not going to speak my language, and I'm just going to sort of work from that assumption to begin with. But the other part of it was to try and think about the opposite of the sort of stuff that I had seen in places like Gitmo. What would it look like if you stripped the power to use linguistic violence to create an alternate reality? And that led me to a place of two people interacting fully outside of that construct. Beautiful. So I want to open it up for questions, Q&A. You guys can please feel free to use the microphone over here um, to ask any questions that you may have. Please keep your mask on while you're asking the questions. Um, if anyone wants to be the first to... <laughs> This isn't even on. Now it is. Um, what the anthropologist Ann Stoller calls the politics of disregard, right? Um, not just uh, who it is that we see as worthy of empathy versus not, as Usman was saying, vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, but also the fact that that we sitting here, you know, in the on the East Coast, um, in this very nice building, can even disregard the pain of other people. But I wonder if um, the three of you, the four of you, could speak to the politics of disregard in a different sense, which is that one thing that concerns me is that the way that we talk about refugees, even from a critical stance, tends to depoliticize the people that we think of when we think about refugees or uh, victims of political discrimination. So for example, Omar uh, brought up the example of Guantanamo Bay. And on the one hand, Guantanamo is a symbol of uh, the violence of American uh, military governance. Um, it's kind of mercilessness and definitely unconstitutionality. But it's also, in a sense, um, a symbol of a kind of political resistance that has been delegitimized by the sort of progenitors of American empire, 
um, which is that anything that is considered that could be under the label of jihad is automatically like delegitimizes terrorism. So I guess my question is, what would it mean to not just take seriously refugees, non-white refugees, as objects of empathy, but also take them seriously as political beings um, who have ideas about politics that sometimes do involve violence, um, understanding the limitations of that while also respecting that as a way of trying to build new political imaginaries for the future. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, if you in my opinion, I think, um, yes, you, you're absolutely right. We need to, I mean, tackle the political leaders to seek for this change. Of course, yes. But I remember a word my father used to tell me that when um, a tree is still small, you can try to direct it to grow the way you want it. But once you have a big tree, which is not straight and like that, and you try to put it straight, you break it. That's my village, our kind of expressions we use in my community. I don't know whether it's understood in English or not. But what I'm trying to say is that we can always change the children from the bottom. Those, these children are the future, are going to be the future politicians. At least, in my opinion, that's what I've done. When I realized that education is what has given me the opportunity, the tool to be listened, to be invited in different, different places in Spain, I decided to share this. I promise you, when I went to Ghana for the first time, after a, a number of intents to have a meeting with the Minister of Education, finally he told me that the government of Ghana doesn't have any pin to create a, fet, a first uh, digital school. That was a huge disappointment for me because I was really promised to create computer schools. But that disappointment from the Minister of Education in Ghana shows me that I'm the minister of my community. I'm the president of my world. Assuming this responsibility, I created just one school 12 years ago. Today, it's about 45 different schools, 43 schools, sorry. The two new ones are going to be open in June. Why am I saying this? I'm just trying to sh show how things changed. Sometimes you can't change from the top. You have to start from the starting point, the bottom. And the real case is that at least in my organization, which I'm the founder, NASCO Feeding Minds, where we feed mine, we don't feed stomach. The first success case story, last two years in Ghana, the youngest parliamentary candidate was from our, our initiative. That's how things changed, not from the top, but rather from the bottom, at least in my opinion. Of course, we need to focus also tackling, we can't allow Trump and other people to be doing what they are doing, of course not. But I, I think the real change comes from the bottom, not from the top. So, I mean. Anyone, did either of you want to add anything? No, really fast, I think you're touching something that is really important. Words can be twisted, words can be used for different purposes, as you pointed out. And the word refugee can be used in a self-congratulatory way. But, but more than that, the word refugee can be used just to, to define a human being just as a body that suffers, just as, the, as, a, as a body that is in, in pain. And what I think we can do to, to fight that political understanding of that word is to do some political listening. And by this I mean that we, yes, we have to, to pay attention to the, suffer, to the pain of others, but we have to pay attention in the terms that it, these others talk about their pain and in the terms in which people talk about their experiences. And, I, uh, uh, and what I know is that 
people that are uh, that are refugees of, of of different of different kinds don't see themselves just as flesh that can be destroyed. They don't see themselves just as victims, but they have a, 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 a very complex array of ways of understanding themselves. And so listening in this way is a, is a, is a, political, uh, uh, is a, is a political position. And I think that goes to what we do here. I think that more than assuming at least that's what I try to do. More than assuming that I am the voice or of the oppressed or the voice of the people without voice, that we just have to assume that we have to learn how to listen. And maybe we can we can enrich ourselves with that, but not put ourselves in in this detached position in which I will give you refuge because all you are is flesh that suffer. You know. Does anyone else have another question? Yes, please. Um, thank you so much for the conversation and the work that you've shared with us. I love this idea of um, taking something that's far away and putting it into the heart of the empire. And I, my, my question is around how to do that more often. Um, there are so many stories uh, from the countries you're writing about and have been a part of and that um, the empire probably knows very little about. And so I'm wondering um, partly like what the process was for you, but more so what it could be like for you know, the hundreds of millions and frankly billions of people. I lived in Pakistan for eight years and it's the fifth largest country, but you could probably count on one or two hands like how many books uh, come out um, in America from Pakistan in English. Well, although there are a lot of books in Urdu, uh, people do read those books and write those stories, but there's not that much um, of an international audience uh, or a readership. And I think a lot of that is because of publishing and gatekeeping. Um, and so I guess part of my question is also, are you seeing hope in the way that publishing is trying to evolve um, and what more can be done? Thanks. Um, thank you for that. Uh, um, uh, it's it's a fascinating question. Um, I there there exist templates. They're just in a very unexpected form. When I was when I set out to write my first novel, this book called American War, all I wanted to do was invert a trope that I'd seen in the other direction so many times. Uh, if you ever watch any James Bond movie, any Jason Bourne movie, there's always a scene on an exotic Caribbean island or a car chase through a Moroccan bazaar, and it's fully understood that the place is scenery. The place is the table, and the tablecloth being laid on top of it is someone else's story. And so all I wanted to do was flip that around, and I wanted to make America the table, and I wanted to lay another people's story on top of it. And I often say that if I'd written the book 100 years earlier, I would have called it British War, because the point was not to set it in America, the point was to set it in the heart of the empire. Um, I finished the book in, uh, I finished the first draft in the summer of 2015, and then three weeks later, Donald Trump announced he was running for president. Uh, the book ends up coming out four months into the Trump administration, and instead of being read the way I thought I had intended it, it is overwhelmingly read as an American story. This is where we're headed. This is the kind of conflict we're going to have. And that was great for my royalty statement. Uh, a lot more people bought the book on that understanding of what it was, but in terms of what I intended versus how it was read, there's a chasm between those two things that I'll never be able to bridge. Um, and so that speaks to part of your question, this notion of like the risks or downsides of trying to, to operate in that kind of form. Um, but fundamentally, the tool set exists. And, and like I said, it's not a particularly clever trick, you know. Um, and, it, and, it, and it stems from this notion of just how easy it is 
for fo and I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing and I apologize, but just for folks in this part of the world to immediately have a real limitation of imagination when it comes to problems of people who don't look like them or who are on the other side of the planet or for whom there is no consequences to not thinking about their particular plight. And so I would eventually keep coming back to this idea of like, how much would your imagination expand if this was happening in Arkansas? How much, we may not find a solution, but I guarantee you your imagination of potential solutions would suddenly expand. And I, I got tired of thinking about that and decided to codify it in, in novel form. Um, but the one thing I will say is that this is a very loud place and will, will very quickly um, overwhelm your intention in that regard. And, and if you intend to invert, sometimes it will be inverted right back uh, and you have to live with that risk. Do we have time to continue? Oh, do we have another question? We might have time for a couple other questions. Um, thank you all. This has been such an extraordinary uh, panel. It's been so wonderful to listen to you all. So I guess I have more of a craft question than anything else. Um, so you all have written books that, you know, exist between a front cover and a back cover, and there's a page count, and there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. How do you take, especially given that, we, that you've talked about such gigantic ideas and notions and thoughts over the course of this talk, how do you take all of that and shape that into the story? Or does the story come first? How do you turn that all into a coherent narrative? And I'm asking that question, question both of the fiction writers and the nonfiction writers. Um, thank you. For me, it changes with every book. Uh, it's something that I didn't, I didn't understand when I started writing. It's something that I have elaborated after doing the books. Um, and uh, there's something that I call the core of the book, and it, which each book, the core, is something different. In my first book, um, um, Kingdom Cons, the core of the book was the relation between the, the, the two main characters. And then comes another word that I use to explain my work, which is the proliferation of the, of the of the fable around the core, so everything has to proliferate organically with the core, and in this case, it's the landscape, it's the language, it's 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 the plot. In my second novel, the core was a voyage, so everything had to to spring from from that. The, everything had to to convey the idea of what the voyage does to you. And in my third novel, Transmigration of, of, of Bodies, which happens in an epidemic, the whole, the whole idea that the core is the fear in a city that, uh, that everybody is, is fearing the others, you know. And that had to be to determine things in the structure, in the, in, in the way the people speak, and in the way the dramatic line uh, 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 is developed. So, so and uh, just to say it fast, that, that would be part of my process. Um, in my case, I think it's quite simple because definitely, um, as I said, each and every one of us has a mission. And I think my mission was, um, I. For me, sometimes I even think that it's a miracle that I'm alive. It's almost impossible. Sometimes I need to hit myself to feel like I'm still here. I'm not dreaming. So for me, writing was like um, a therapy for me, a way of um, giving voice to those who can't have it today. And that was my first book, which is Now of the Paradise. And my second book, mainly, is just about how uh, this. My, in the part of the world I know, I know the migration in the in U.S. is quite different from uh, the kind of migration we receive in, 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 in Spain, in Europe, and in general. So, um, yes, arrive, once you arrived after all these terrible issues, for example, to be able to survive in this new uh, world is absolutely complicated. So definitely, um, my second book mainly is about how does people like me arriving in a world where we use signs. You t I still remember asking the first 
person who tried to assist me, which is my adopted mom this, today, it was like, go to a uh, street, num- uh, in, in, in Spain, we don't have, we don't, we, this, every street has a name, like street name, this, number that, and that, and what is a street? Claro, in my f- way of at, uh, understanding, in my world, there's no, no, no streets, no roads. So I think it was quite interesting to also um, explain the, the differences of culture once I arrived in Spain and the big, the most attractive part of it. Because I still remember when I went to the supermarket, I normally I was looking for chicken to kill it and then have the flesh. I didn't see meat in the supermarket when I, in the beginning. <laughs> That's the reality. So yes, those kind of things uh, that push me to be able to share this also experience to the uh, readers to get to know our different cultures, but at the same time, that's our strength. Well, it looks like we're out of time, but I just want to thank you all so much for being a part of this amazing panel, Um, and if you guys can give a round of applause to our amazing author. (laughs) 